Hi, I'm Andre. I'm a developer evangelist here at content.ai and uh, in this video I want to show you who we are, what we do and how you can focus on code and not your headless CMS. Now, I could start uh, saying nice things about uh, our platform, when we were founded, how many projects are actually running on our platform um, and so on, but I figured it'd be better to just think about your organization and how um, content works within the scope of organizations. So content actually has to be always on. It always needs to be available 24 seven on the channels and platforms your customers expect it to. And this is by no means a trivial task. There is so much uh, work around it. And um, there is a lot of uh, teams that are actually involved in the content production. And when there are some inefficiencies um, in the team's communication, it's not directly visible um, as the, the total cost of these inefficiencies is uh, hidden in the TCO of all uh, the involved teams. And at the end of the day, it's all about experiences. The experience of you, your team, team of content writers, and the experience of the visitors coming to your site, consuming the content. The thing is, content is a central piece of um, every step of customer journey. Regardless where they are coming from, uh, they will always need to get content to uh, get to your site, to um, so you can earn credibility through the content and then they engage with you. Uh, they become customers of yours. Um, so content is uh, the central piece of, of all of these steps. Now, why do organizations need a platform for modular content, you might ask? This is the place where I can explain our vision and what we actually do, what our product does. What, uh, what we envision is we want organizations to be able to reuse as much content as possible to streamline the, the cost of uh, content production. We want content editors to uh, feel comfortably in our platform so that they can focus on the messages they want to deliver to the world instead of fighting the platform, fighting the, the limits that were set uh, out by the platform for them and so on. So the reusability is a key piece of uh, our vision. And when the content is reusable, it also becomes portable. You can use it on multiple channels and you don't need to focus on a single um, website or single uh, application, but you can reuse the content among multiple channels and have editors change it just in one place. And at the end of the day, this also benefits developers because developers don't have to talk to many people in order to get some piece of content, but they can use the API to get the content from a single source of truth system. That's where our platform uh, is and our platform gives it to them via APIs. Uh, but let's talk about uh, the technical parts. Now, uh, our platform supports anything that can handle HTTP requests. So we don't, we don't, we're not opinionated, opinionated in this sense. Um, but uh, today I'll show you some of our tooling around .NET. So uh, .NET and JavaScript are two of our main platforms, and I'll show you how to build a content model uh, uh, code, or how to build content model code first using a .NET platform. Uh, and the management uh, SDK. I'll show you how to edit content in the content.ai user interface. I'll show you how to automatically generate model classes in .NET from the content model. Uh, this can also be uh, part of a, of a build process. And at the end, I'll show you fetching content items from uh, the CDN using the .NET SDK and do a bit of a preview. So let's focus first on building the content model code first. So I'll switch to Visual Studio. Now, this is a boilerplate. Uh, I'll share the link down in the video description. This is a boilerplate of uh, the content migrations uh, .NET project. And uh, you see that there are a bunch of migrations. So essentially, each migration is a code file that has a task, and the task contains a management client. Management client is something that you can use to get and um, push data into uh, the CMS. And uh, you see, at uh, in this first step, it actually creates a content type. And the content type is called blog. Uh, I think there is uh, another step for actually creating the data. So this, is, this only creates a blog um, content type with the title, author, text, and is featured fields. But in the second step, we actually create content items. So you see in this cycle, we are creating content item. And the content item is uh, of type blog, 
And you see, it will all have the same title uh, differentiated just by the index number. So this is how uh, the migrations work. This can also be used for getting data from other uh, systems into content.ai. Uh, some other migrations are here, but uh, I feel for explanation, this is sufficient. Um, just so you know, the, uh, the data for uh, the project, they actually come from the environments JSON file where we have the project ID and an API key. The API key is something that uh, actually authenticates us so we can perform these kinds of operations. Um, so let me run this. I'll first build it and then run it. So this is uh, the migration to running. You see that the content e type was uh, created. Then we create the content items uh, and also variants because every content item can have multiple language variants. And once this is finished, we can move back into the application. So let me just open a browser here. So this is what you see when you log in uh, to the content AI application for the first time. Now, um, obviously we already created some content. So when I refresh the page, we should see our articles. So you see there is a zero till eight. We've got nine steps of the cycle. And there are also two authors. Um, when we look at the blog post, uh, you see that uh, the UI was uh, streamlined for editors, so they can um, uh, collaborate on, uh, on this item quite easily. If you want to change a title, you can either provide comments or you can do a suggestion. Let's say we want to make this a tea instead of coffee. And then on each suggestions, we can actually uh, work with comments and maybe even tag someone who is in the project too. Does this sound good? And this will actually send uh, an email to my colleague to go and, and check this out. The same goes for tasks. So if there is something you know more uh, that you need from someone, you can also assign tasks to them, finish and publish and assign it again to someone who is responsible for doing that. There can also be a due date. So let me set the due date to tomorrow. And what uh, this will do as well is when you go back to home, uh, there is a calendar that is uh, uh, logging all these changes. So you see that about coffee number seven is actually due tomorrow. All other items were already published. So this is the editorial calendar. In the home, you also see all the items that you've worked on in, uh, recently. Now, because the migrations always run in scope of a user, uh, all these items are uh, noted here because uh, in the end, I added them, uh, even though uh, it happened through the API, but you see that the last item is actually the first. So if you're working on uh, specific items um, every day, they will always be here and always easily accessible. Uh, so that's what we, what we do in terms of uh, editors. Of course, there are workflows, roles, uh, collections, uh, environments, all those things that you would expect from, uh, from an enterprise level uh, CMS, but uh, uh, we could be here for another hour or two uh, before I explain everything. So this is how, uh, in a nutshell, this works. And we can move on to another step. Let me see what that is. Uh, so we did just the editing now. And the next thing is to automatically generate model classes. So this is uh, another feature of uh, the .NET boilerplate. Uh, I'll just switch to another one that is um, uh, content boilerplate.net. And this is, uh, this is the other part. So the migrations project was kind of an internal project that allows you to work with the API and get the data into the system. Uh, with the boilerplate.net, this is a project that is the front end. So we handle the back end, uh, we handle the content management, but the front end, if it's a website, if it's a mobile app, if it's a smartwatch app, whatever you need, um, that's in, um, uh, in your hands. So the boilerplate is actually one part of the front end that you could use but you can also use anything else. Uh, in this case, this is a .NET project, so we have a startup file. In the startup configuration, you will see that we're adding a thing that is called delivery client. Delivery client is something that gets data from the CDN, um, and you can work with it in a, in a nice way in .NET, so you don't have to write your own REST uh, requests, but you can do it via the delivery client. Uh, the delivery client obviously needs a project ID, so that comes from the configuration. And uh, then we have it available in every controller. So uh, this is an MVC project. So I'm just, I'm just going to go to home controller. Uh, you see here that we're using the delivery client. 
And in the index action, I'm actually awaiting uh, delivery client to get me items of type blah um, that are limited by, by number six, uh, only in the first depth and ordered by the block code name. Now, before we can use this, uh, like this, uh, this block code name, we first need to generate the models. Um, the models you can see here, content types, uh, they are actually generated as a pre-built step. Uh, so before every build, uh, the, the project will actually go into content. There is a tool that will download all the content types that are in the, in the uh, project. And it will generate model classes based on um, the, the content types that you created or that you have in your model. So here you see we have a, a block and author. And uh, they, they are also extensible. So you see um, the tool generates them as a public partial class. So in uh, the scope of, for example, blog, there is an author which is not typed, right? Here we see it only as an enumerable object. But we know that uh, there can only be uh, an author uh, content type. So we can actually enhance the model class and we can add here um, a little accessor or getter that will give us the, the typed author. So this is the way you can extend the, the content models. And uh, uh, then when you look at the home controller, we're getting the data and we're returning a view that will show us the list of all the blog posts. So let me, uh, get back into the system. I'm just going to create a new blog post so that we can see something change. So let's add a new blog and uh, I'm just going to call it video blog, video blog text. And let's uh, link an author. Let's say Jane Doe and publish this item. Now, because we are using a CDN to deliver the content to wherever you need it, uh, it may take a second for the content to be propagated uh, to the CDN, but uh, in a second we should be able to do a .NET build. So you see, during the .NET build, there is a tool content.ai model generator that uh, was restored and that it created four content type uh, models. Now that's what I was talking about, so it created the, the strongly type models. You see the build went through, uh, which, is, which is good, and let's run the project now. This should only be a second, and we should see the project on HTTPS localhost. So I'm just gonna switch back here, and we can take a look at the website. So you see, this is my let's get started website, content AI boilerplate, and we only have six um, articles here. My one isn't displayed here because it's ordered by a uh, title. So let me fix that. I'm just gonna stop it. And Let's change the sort order to descending. And let's try it again. All right, so you see, this is my video blog, just what I, what I created a second ago. So this is in a nutshell how this all works. Uh, I'll share the links for the respective repositories uh, in the video description. Um, let me get back to the presentation now. And uh, so that's what we already did. Um, and of course, we are a Microsoft-based company, uh, or not, we're a Microsoft partner, not Microsoft-based. Um, so the whole platform uh, actually runs on Azure. Uh, it's a multi-tenant solution, so you can, uh, in the scope of uh, each project, you can define in which data center you want your project to run in. Um, we don't allow you to run uh, the system on-premise, but if you are demanding and you want to you wanna have a dedicated infrastructure, it's also possible. Um, we want to host it uh, ourselves because we have a two weeks uh, release cycle, and we want to ensure that um, everyone using the system gets all the new features um, every two weeks. So that's why we want to handle uh, the, the deployment and, uh, and hosting and of course scaling and, and all the other things. Um, and uh, uh, of course there are many brands that are already using the system, just to name a few on this slide. Uh, for each of the industry uh, specific uh, field we have a separate slide, so I, I wouldn't want to include all of that here. Uh, but you can definitely ask uh, any sales guy um, if there are maybe uh, some, some names in, in your industry that would be worth mentioning. Uh, and that's all for me today. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. 
Uh, if you want to reach out to me, uh, then feel free to use any channel available, and uh, I'll see you next time.